everybody. Good, good afternoon. Welcome to Virology. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm going to be your professor for this entire course. I'm going to teach every lecture about viruses to you until May. I love viruses. I'm absolutely crazy about them. I think they're the coolest things on the planet. I've been working on them in my lab for over 40 years uh, up at the medical school here of Columbia. And eight years ago, this is the eighth year I'm teaching this class now, eight years ago I decided that Columbia University needed a virology course. I think viruses are amazing and you need to know about viruses yourself. We live and prosper in a world full of viruses. Viruses infect every living thing on the planet. They infect all of you. Right now, every one of you is infected and you're probably shedding viruses. Viruses are in the air of this room. Wherever you go on the planet, there are viruses on surfaces, doorknobs, bathrooms. You can't avoid them. Not only are we all infected, but we eat and breathe billions of virus particles every day of our lives. And in fact, we carry viral genomes as part of our genetic material. You can thank your parents for that. They gave it to you because this DNA is in your germline and you're gonna pass it on to your kids as well. And we'll talk a lot about how you get them and what good they are to you. But viruses are everywhere and that is one of the main points I want you to get from this course. They're in us normally. They're not just things that make you sick. Now, the, the viral strategy for success is to make a lot of themselves. Billions and billions of particles on a daily basis. And let's look at some of these numbers. So here is a slide which explains the number of bacteriophages that are on the planet. These are viruses that infect bacteria. The ocean is full of them. They're about, there are millions and millions of bacteriophages in a teaspoon of seawater. Next time you go swimming and take some water in your mouth, just think you're taking up millions and millions of bacteriophages. There are 10 to the 30th particles in all of the world's oceans alone. That number is amazingly big, bigger than Avogadro's number. So let's see if we can translate it into something that makes an impact. So a phage particle weighs about a femtogram. So if you add up the 10 to the 30th particles, you get uh, a biomass that exceeds that of elephants by a thousand fold. Okay, these are particles you can't see. That's the amazing thing. There are so many of them, they make a huge impact. Now, if you lined up these bacteriophage particles, and by the way, on the slide here on the left is a reconstruction, a, a computer reconstruction of what a bacteriophage of one type looks like. If you line them up head to tail, 10 to the 30th phages, it would go over 100 million light years into space. That is just amazing. That's farther than the nearest galaxy. It's huge. It's going 100 million years at the speed of light. And these are phages, virus particles that you can't even see. That's how big uh, that number is. Whales, for example, in the ocean are infected with small RNA viruses called Khaleesi viruses. They're shown here on the lower left. They're related to viruses that infect us and cause gastroenteritis diarrhea, vomiting. Whales excrete 10 to the 13th particles a day. It can, these viruses can make them sick, but the point here is that these animals are shedding virus into the oceans, and that virus can go on and infect other animals there as well, fish as well as mammals. Every living thing on the planet is infected by a virus some way or other, and not just one, by multiple viruses. They're not just bad news. I want you to remember that. You may have been interested in viruses because they cause diseases, but in fact, the vast majority of viruses on the planet don't make anybody sick. They're actually beneficial. In the oceans alone, this is a good example of the, the benefit of viruses. There are more viruses in a liter of coastal seawater than all the people on Earth. Just one liter, it's amazing. Now, in the oceans, if you look at the biomass of different entities, the pie chart on the lower left, the prokaryotes in yellow, they went out. They have more biomass in the waters than anything else. The protists and the viruses, red and blue, they're very small compared to prokaryotes, but that's by mass. If you look at particle numbers, 
Now the viruses win, shown on the right here. 94% of all the particles in the oceans, a particle could be a bacterium, a protist, or a virus. The viruses have 94% of the particles. So they win in terms of numbers in the oceans. Now you may say, so what? Who cares? Well, the, in fact, if you took the viruses away from the ocean, it would probably impact global cycles, and I'm not sure life would be the same on Earth as it was before then. Viruses cause so many infections per second, it's something like 10 to the 23rd infections per second in the oceans, that they liberate organic material, which can then sink to the bottom of the ocean. It's recycled by uh, metabolism in various organisms and released. So they're really important for geochemical cycles, like carbon cycles. Without them, life would be very different. Here's another number that's quite stunning. There are 10 to the 16th genomes of HIV, human immunodeficiency virus particles, on the planet today. This is a virus that we will devote an entire lecture to. Very few viruses get the single lecture treatment in this course because it's not about learning individual viruses. It's about learning principles, how all viruses work. But HIV is so important that we're going to devote a single lecture to it. 10 to the 16th genomes. We know that because we know there are about 35 million people infected today, and we know how many genomes they carry. So how big is 10 to the 16th? Well, it's so big, and that combined with the mutation rate of viruses, which we'll talk about in this course. There is already resistance in these genomes to all the antivirals we have for HIV today. We have about 30 or so antiviral drugs to treat infection. Resistance to all of them is already here among these 10 to the 16th genomes, as well as to any antivirals we'll ever develop. Doesn't matter how many we develop, there's resistance out there to all of them. That's how big the number is, and that's the strategy of viral replication, to make so many offspring that some of them are going to succeed. How infected are you? I used to ask a question of the class, how many of you have had a virus infection? And typically, 10 people would raise their hands, but in fact, you're all infected. You may remember certain episodes of being ill, but right now you're all infected. How infected are you? You'd be surprised. First of all, you have about a dozen herpes viruses in you, uh, including herpes simplex viruses, varicella zoster virus, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, and the human herpes viruses of various numbers. You typically acquire these very early on in your life. As soon as you're born, you know, your parents hug you and kiss you, and their saliva contains these viruses, and they pass them on to you unwittingly. If you haven't obtained Epstein-Barr virus, by the time you go to college, you will get it uh, then as well. And these viruses may cause a transient disease initially in you, but then they become latent and they remain with you forever. These infections are for life, and you will periodically make more virus with or without the production of disease symptoms. So you're infected with herpes viruses for entire, your entire life until you are dead. But these are not the only viruses that you have in you. There are hundreds of thousands of others in all different parts of your body. Now, I'm sure many of you know that we and all life forms on Earth have a microbiome in us. We have a collection of bacteria in humans. The number of bacteria we carry is about equal to the number of human cells that we actually have. But there are also viruses. This is a, a map of the microbiome. There are specific collections of bacteria in different parts of our bodies, in the digestive tract, on the skin, uh, the urogenital tract, the eye, the throat, etc. All of these collections of bacteria you acquire uh, during development in utero and then shortly after birth, and they define your life afterwards. They define in great part what other infections you're going to get. They define in great part what other diseases you're going to develop, diseases uh, like obesity or diabetes. Microbiome is very important. But I want you to remember that part of the microbiome is the virome, all the viruses we have. It's been harder to understand exactly what these viruses do for us because we can't take them out of us. With bacteria, we can treat people with antibiotics, which we do regularly, and we know that taking away bacteria early in life has consequences. And so a lot of research now is going into figuring out what those bacteria are and how to give them back to people who are ill. Can't do that with viruses. There are no broad spectrum 
antiviral compounds. Someday there will be, and we'll be able to see what happens when we take our virome away. So here's an example of our virome. These are two different studies that were done and published. You can see the references down there at the bottom. The one on the right simply took human blood and sequenced all of the nucleic acid in human blood, just bulk sequencing everything. And then here, the percentage of different organisms are shown. 70% of the sequences are viral. The vast majority of DNA in human blood is viral. That's amazing. That's how many virus particles are floating around. Uh, you have some bacteria. 10% of the sequences are bacteria. You have some eukaryotic sequences, including human DNA. And then, this is interesting down here, 15% unknown because we haven't seen it before, so we don't know how to classify it. I guess it's probably all viral as well. Enormous amounts of viral sequences in us. On the left is another study where they did sampling of different organ systems in humans, and again, sequenced to find out what viruses are present. And you can see the nervous system, uh, the various teguments, the respiratory tract, genitourinary tract, digestive tract, the blood, each has its own complement of viruses. They're listed here according to whether they have DNA uh, or RNA as their genomes. There are tons of them. Now, having a DNA sequence doesn't mean that the virus is actually present and replicating. I will be the first to acknowledge that. And you have to be very wary of any report which says, you know, we found a DNA from some pathogenic bacterium or virus on this desktop because you don't know if if the organism is actually there. But we have very easy ways to identify DNA sequences, so we apply them widely, and that's where these studies come from. But I'll bet there are lots of infectious viruses in us as well. As I said earlier, we have viral DNA as part of our DNA. It's in the germline, so we pass it on to our offspring. And these are infections by viruses that happened many, many years ago when we were first homo sapiens and maybe even precursors of homo sapiens. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So our DNA is shown here as a pie chart. 3.2 billion bases comprise our genome. Uh, the protein coding genes, 1.5%, a little sliver of what is there in our genome. Lots of other things like uh, introns, intervening sequences, and various other sorts of repeated elements like small interspersed nuclear elements, long interspersed nuclear elements. But here I want to point out the LTR retro transposons, 8%. These are remnants of viral infection. A family of viruses called the retroviruses have the unique property of having their DNA, their, G their RNA genome converted to DNA, and then it's integrated into the genome of the host cell. And so for us, 8%, of our DNA is retroviral. That integration ha happened in the germline. It's called, these are called endogenous retroviruses, and we'll talk a lot about these later because we think at least some of them are actually benefiting us. So we've co-opted some of these retroviral genes to use them in our daily life. Really interesting story. Now, you've heard me talk now for 10 minutes about how many viruses you have, yet all of you look pretty healthy. And that's because we have a great immune system, which establishes a balance between uh, normal health and pathology. Our immune system, which is pretty complicated, uh, diagrammed a little bit on the left here, uh, is great at keeping our virome and our microbiome in check. And when things get awry, when you have, when you're immunosuppressed, for example, if you're gonna have an organ transplant and you receive immunosuppressive drugs, so you won't reject the organ, boom, all these viruses become a problem. So you get a liver transplant, you're immunosuppressed. The big problem is cytomegalovirus coming out and replicating uncontrollably because your immune system can't handle it. If you are infected with a virus that causes immunosuppression, like HIV or measles, you, then a lot of the viruses that you carry will begin to replicate and cause disease. We'll consider some examples of this throughout the course, but the main point here is that when your immune system is healthy, it keeps your virome and your microbiome under control. When it's down for whatever reason, uh, then you can no longer control these viruses and bacteria. They replicate out of control and cause problems. Now, we're not gonna 
talk much about the immune system in this course. This, this course is focused on viruses. Hopefully some of you at least took Moshewitz's immunology course uh, in the fall, and you'll get the little we do say about immunology. But we're going to have two or three lectures where we talk about the immune response in terms of how it interacts with viral infection. To continue with this theme that not all viruses make you sick, I want to tell you a story about a collection of small DNA viruses uh, shown in the upper left here. They're called polyomaviruses. They have a double-stranded circular DNA genome of about 8,000 bases long. They're not very complicated. They don't encode a lot of genes. And all of you are infected with a variety of these polyomaviruses. For the most part, you don't, they don't make you sick, again, unless you are immunosuppressed in some way. You can use the pattern of infection with these viruses to trace population movements because they are passed among family members, typically. So parents will pass these polyomaviruses onto their children and so forth. So you can use, uh, you can look at, you can do serological surveys, you could look for antibodies against these viruses, and they're distinguishable. Different populations have different kinds of polyomaviruses. You can actually trace migration of early humans from Africa uh, across Europe uh, and into uh, Asia and the Americas. In fact, this black line, these black lines, are the movement of human populations from uh, Africa into Europe, across Asia, down into Australia, across the land bridge into Americas. You can absolutely trace how people have moved by looking at their antibodies to polyomaviruses. The, the dotted line are the movements you can trace by sequencing human DNA. It's much less uh, detailed than we can get from virus infections. So we can get a lot of information by looking at what kinds of infections you've had. And again, the main point here, they're not making you ill. There are examples of good viruses, but they're typically not from human studies because, as I said earlier, very difficult to do experiments to take away viruses from people and see what happens. We can do that in other experimental systems. Here's an example of a virus that's beneficial for a plant. This is a grass called uh, Dicanthelium languinosum. If you've ever been to Yellowstone National Park or any of these parks with hot springs where there's water over 100 degrees Celsius there, right around the edges there are plants growing. And this is one of them that can tolerate very, very high temperatures. Well, it turns out that the reason this plant can grow at high temperatures, you can bring it in the lab and try and grow it at high temperatures, it will, but it has in it a fungus. It's colonized by a fungus called Curvularia, Curvularia protuberata that allows the plant to grow at high temperature. If you take the fungus out, which you can do in the laboratory, the plant will now no longer grow at, at high temperatures. The fungus, in turn, is infected with a virus. If you take the virus out of the fungus, the fungus alone is not enough to allow the plant to grow at high temperatures. So you, this is a unique mutualism between a plant, a fungus, and a virus. So the fungus has a place to grow, the virus has a place to grow in the fungus, and the plant gets the benefit from this uh, interaction of a, being able to grow at high temperatures. The, the idea is that these, this fungus produces some products of some sort that allow the growth at high temperatures. What they are, we don't know, but people are working on trying to understand that. Now, a little closer, yes? So all we know is that the virus is infecting the fungus, not the plant. It's a fungal virus, and that you need the, the fungal virus and the fungus within the plant to get plant growth at high temperature. If you take out the virus from the fungus and just put the fungus in the plant, it will not grow at high temperatures. Right. So it's a mutualism that allows growth at high temperatures and that we don't understand the mechanism. Now we get a little closer to home in a mammal system. This is a mouse experiment now where uh, you can grow mice without any bacteria from day one. You can grow them uh, in, in, uh, in, in a facility that doesn't have bacteria and feed them food that's sterile. So you end up making germ-free mice. These mice will grow, but they have problems. And one of the problems they have is that their intestines are, are wrong. They're aberrant. So that's shown on this slide. These are sections of, of mice, of mouse intestines, small intestine. Here's a conventional mouse with its whole complement of gut bacteria. 
and these are the villi of the intestine in a section. You can see they're morphologically normal. Um, and then at the bottom here is a stain for an antigen present on T cells, CD3, and those are the yellow or brown staining cells. So the gut is morphologically normal and it contains the proper amount of lymphocytes. If you grow these mice without uh, bacteria, germ-free mice, now the villi are morphologically aberrant. You can see compared to conventional mice, they have altered appearance. And there are very few T cells, very few T lymphocytes in the gut. So the implication is that the bacteria are required for morphological, normal morphological development of the gut as well as development of the immune system. All right, so that's a known fact and uh, people are working very hard to understand what the bacteria do to allow this. But the cool part about this experiment, which was done here in New York City at uh, New York University by Ken Cadwell's group, is if you take these germ-free mice and now you infect them with a virus called norovirus, so this is a virus related to the viruses that whales shed in the oceans that I showed you earlier. If you infect them with noroviruses, you partially restore the morphology of the small intestine villi. So it's not completely like the conventional mice, but it's improved. And you have more lymphocytes in the gut as well. So again, you take a virus, a normal mouse virus, which mice are known to have in mouse colonies, you infect it, it restores the morphology of the gut. So the suggestion here is that viruses are also participating in development in, of, of different organisms and in development of the immune system. And as I said, we can't do this experiment in humans, but if we get to the point one day where we make antivirals that can wipe out our virome, we can see if, if this effect occurs. So basically, those are some examples of why I think viruses are amazing. And this is just a picture of two different viruses. We can make amazing images of viruses now. We can solve their structures and display the structures. We'll talk about how we do that in a couple of sessions. But what I want to leave you with is this thought that virology is an integrative science. And that means you learn all science when you study viruses. So if you take chemistry, you learn chemistry. You take physics, you learn physics pretty much. But when you take virology, you you're learning chemistry, physics, biochemistry, cell biology, and moving into the populations, epidemiology, ecology, all sorts of sciences. You learn a lot more than viruses. And that's why I assume you know a lot of biology when you're taking this course. I'm going to talk about things like uh, DNA replication, transcription, translation, without explaining them, assuming you know it. But you have to know a lot of things to understand viruses. And as I said earlier, if you have problems, let me know and I can help you sort that out. But once, uh, a couple of years ago in this course, at the end of a course, a freshman came down, and you're not supposed to take this as a freshman, you're supposed to have some biology, but she came down and she said, I really like this course and I got an A in it. I said, great, that's really good. She said, in fact, it's gonna help me with my biology courses because it makes everything else seem put in perspective properly. So when you study a virus, you're gonna learn about all these other things that happen in the cell and, and what they mean. So some of my course goals, besides convincing you that viruses are good and they're not all bad, I wanna, I wanna give you a big picture. I don't wanna teach you about individual viruses. A lot of courses will do that. Introductory virology course at many colleges and universities every lecture will be a different virus. This is almost completely useless. And with respect to my colleagues, they're probably not virologists, and that's the easiest way for them to teach the course. But if they are virologists and they teach it that way, shame on them, because you don't learn any concepts. You learn how one, viruses work, one virus works, and then another, and another, and there's no overview. I wanna give you an overview in this course. That's what I mean by the big picture, so that you in the future could look at any virus and understand what's going on, because we're gonna cover all the major groups. I want you to think about virology as an integrative discipline. I told you just now, virology is an integrative science. It's not a collection of viruses or genes or phylogenetic trees. I want you to see the big picture. And finally, I want you to learn the fundamentals that amaze the informed and frighten the uninformed. Most people 
get really scared when there's a viral outbreak because they don't understand it. Fear comes from not knowing things. I want you to understand viruses so that in the future, if there's an outbreak, something happens, you'll remember and understand and be calm and you can explain to your family or your friends or even if you are a journalist or a politician, you won't do silly things and write silly headlines, but you'll understand and do calm things. I really do think that some of you are gonna go out there and be journalists one day, and so you'll know virology and be able to propagate the truth. I have a bone to pick with the way viruses are portrayed in the news, and this is a capture from a news report of maybe 2009 from CNN. And here this uh, fellow was going through a study that had just been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a study. So in, in 2009, a brand new influenza virus emerged. It was spreading globally. You know, that's scary because there's no vaccine against it. And a, a, a group had done a study where they took ferrets, which are a good animal model for flu, and they infected them with this virus. And it was really pathogenic in the animals. So this fellow was going over the results. It ravages the lungs spreads through the respiratory system, causes lesions, doesn't stay in the head like seasonal flu. It turned out this had nothing to do with people. This was, later on, the virus turned out to be relatively mild in people. This was a ferret study, but they didn't mention this in the news report. And this is the sort of thing that really bothers me, not presenting the facts, but rather being sensational. You know, news outlets need to get views, so they tend to sensationalize things. I want you to be able to see through that. And I think I, it works from year to year because I always get email from people saying, you know, that Ebola outbreak this year when that happened, I really understood it and I realized how sensationalist the press is. So throughout this course, I'll give you some examples of this and who knows, maybe there'll be an outbreak during this course. It, it certainly happens every year. Uh, last year it was Zika emerged just as we were starting uh, this course and a few years before the outbreak in West Africa of Ebola. But if there is something, you'll be able to understand it, and that is my goal. Now, another thing we're going to do during the class, maybe three times each class, is we're going to do some online quizzing, uh, which is true. All viruses make us sick and can be lethal. Our immune system can manage most infections. Humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. The press is usually correct in their virology reporting, or our immune system cannot handle most viral infections. So let's see which one correct here. Our, our immune system can manage most viral infections. That's the key point here. Um, and that's why, because you're full of viruses and you're healthy, because you have a good immune system. Only when it's down do you have a problem. Probably one person or two people and the others answered, uh, see, humans are usually infected with one virus at a time. You're full of viruses, hundreds and hundreds of them. And our immune system cannot handle most viral infections is clearly not true. All right, so we'll use that periodically to uh, track your progress here. All right, now let's start with the nuts and bolts. What is a virus? We have to have a definition because you probably don't have one, or if you do, it may be different from mine. It's basically a piece of nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, uh, surrounded by protein or membrane or both. And we call it an infectious obligate intracellular parasite. Now, what does all that mean? So nucleic acid is quite clear. DNA, and viruses are unusual because some of them have RNA as genetic material. And as far as we know, there isn't any other uh, form of life on Earth that has RNA. So viruses are unique. And we will talk about why we think that's so later on. Infectious, of course, means it can go from one host to another or one cell to another. And obligate intracellular parasite. This is really important. This means the viruses have to get inside, not only inside of you, but inside of your cells in order to replicate. They will not replicate without getting inside of a cell. Remember that, it's really key. I mean, it'll be obvious you know, in three weeks or so, but you should remember it now because it means that every virus has to get in a cell because it can't provide all it needs on its own in order to replicate. And you can see here, there are viruses of all different sizes and shapes. There are bewildering numbers of different sorts of viruses. And in this course, I don't want to teach you all of them. I want to teach you the principles about how specific groups work. So in virology, we, because viruses are 
obligate parasites. They depend on host functions. When you study them, you learn about the host. No matter what host it is, humans or protozoans or plants, you learn about the host. And so many discoveries in biology have been made through viruses, like splicing. Splicing of RNA was discovered in viruses. And the modifications of mRNAs, like the cap in the poly A tail, and so many other processes. In fact, early on in the field of molecular biology, we could only study DNA synthesis in virus-infected cells. We had no way to study the cell itself. And a lot of our understanding of origins of replication, uh, leading and lagging strand replication, replication forks, all of that came from viruses. So viruses have this amazing way of, of il illustrating the host because they absolutely require it. Now here is the question. Are viruses alive or not? And I have a poll on my blog. As you can see here, I took this screenshot the other day. I have 6,000 people who have voted. Uh, 1,800 say yes, no, 2,000, and an equal number in between. So you can see people out there. And my, my blog is read by a wide range of people from, I think, uh, middle school kids all the way up to professionals and retired people. There's a lot of division about whether a virus is alive or not. So I've thought about this for many years. And there's an easy answer, which I want to share with you. It depends what you mean when you say, is a virus alive? Because a virus really consists of two parts. There's the virus particle on the left here. These are these pretty things that I've shown you a bit of so far, different sizes, different shapes. That's a virus particle. It contains nucleic acid, protein, and maybe some lipid. How can that be living? can't do anything on its own. It has to get into a cell. So to say a virus particle is living is, in my view, not correct. However, when the virus particle gets into a cell, it begins to reproduce. It actually takes over the cell. And the infected cell is clearly living. So I view a virus as an organism with two phases. There's a non-living phase, the virus particle. And then there's the living phase, the infected cell. So again, it, it depends on what you mean by virus. When I say virus, I mean this organism with two phases. But when most people say virus, they mean the particle. And it can't be correct to say that the particle is living. All right, so think about that. That's an easy way to uh, resolve this conundrum, I think. One warning to you as we go through this course, avoid anthropomorphic statements or analyses of viruses and what what, what they proceed through, through their infectious cycles. Viruses don't think, or they don't, they don't employ, they don't ensure, exhibit, display. They do nothing that is active like we would do. They are, they are passive agents. They're just responding to selection pressures. They don't think about what they're doing, obviously, but there's no predetermined notions about what's going to happen. Most importantly, they don't achieve their goals in a human-centered manner. If you start to look at viruses and you say things like, well, the virus wanted to do this to avoid this immune response, you are putting a human value on what the virus is doing, and that's wrong, because I don't think viruses obey the same rules that we do. So I want you to divorce yourself of that. Don't, it's very hard to do this. And in fact, when we wrote our textbook, we had to go through and take out all the examples of viruses doing something, and I bet we left a few in. So if any of you find them, let me know. But it's wrong to do it. But it's much easier, of course, to say vi when the virus antagonizes the immune system. That's kind of an active process. It so happens that it makes gene products that will interfere with certain steps in the immune response. But that is an entirely passive process. It's just a matter of you thinking of viruses in a different way, not in a human-centered way. So viruses are small. In fact, originally the definition of a virus had to do with its size, as we'll see in a moment. And this slide begins to show you that. Here's an E. coli bacterium, 100,000 times magnified. And on its surface is a bacteriophage. So you can see the phage is rather small compared to the bacteria. Here is HIV, uh, panel D. And C is a, a tube rod-shaped rod virus called tobacco mosaic virus, which we'll talk about in a moment. It's a plant virus. But viruses are even smaller. This panel here is, is amplified on the right. And it shows you a couple of viruses. Here is 
for example, one virus, poliovirus uh, in H, and above it is a ribosome, uh, an antibody molecule, a tRNA, and A is a carbon atom, or as small as you can make it with the dot that you can see. So you can see viruses approach atomic level in terms of their size. They're quite small, and they're comparable in size to many uh, cellular structures. This is magnified a million times. And here's another way of looking at the size. On the top of a scale showing from uh, atoms through small molecules, proteins, ribosomes, we put viruses between ribosomes and bacteria, animal cells, plant cells, and then very large things. And uh, viruses uh, you can't see in the, in the light microscope for the most part. There's, there is one exception, which I'll tell you about in a moment. You need an electron microscope in order to visualize viruses. And here on the bottom is a picture of an infected cell. And here's the nucleus and the cytoplasm there. And the box is a herpes virus. It's expanded at the right. So you can get a, an idea of the size of the virus compared to the cell. And remember, this is a two-dimensional representation of the cell. So it's flat. You don't appreciate the cell's volume. And below herpes virus is a poliovirus, which is considerably smaller, 30 nanometers in diameter versus 200. The question that everyone asks, of course, is how many viruses can fit on the head of a pin uh, here is a pin magnified, uh, and in the middle is a virus, but there are also some other components here. Uh, there's red blood cells, uh, there is yeast, there's pollen, um, and then in the middle here are some bacteria. And then the viruses are the very, very tiny things that you can barely see on the screen here. The pink one is Ebola virus, uh, and then if you zoomed in even more, you would see rhinoviruses. So you can fit 500 million rhinoviruses uh, on the head of a pin. They're very, very small. When you sneeze, you're expelling many, many millions of rhinoviruses, and that's why you can efficiently transmit them to other people. And that's something we'll talk about quite a lot in this course. Now, although viruses were originally defined as being very small, we've recently found some really big ones, which are very, very interesting. And here is one called Mimi virus. And you can see this reconstruction of a Mimi virus compared to a rhinovirus, which we've just talked about, 500 can fit on the head of a pin, and HIV, which is slightly bigger. When Mimi viruses were discovered, we were amazed. These were the biggest viruses found to date by, by many times over. Uh, and um, they challenge our notion of what viruses are. But I tell you, they are still viruses. They are still obligate intracellular parasites. Even though their genomes are huge and encode many, many proteins, they still require a cell in which to reproduce. The biggest virus we know of so far uh, is Pandora virus. It's a big virus containing DNA. And it's shown schematically at the bottom here. And this is an electron micrograph on the upper right. On the left is a light micrograph. So this is an image you could go into many labs here and take. You can see these viruses under the light microscope. They're about one and a half microns in length. And that's something that's visible in a light microscope. The biggest viruses visualized to date. Most you cannot see in a light microscope. This is highly unusual. We'll talk a little bit about these viruses later on, why they're so big and what do they code for. A key concept that you'll have to remember is that viruses replicate very differently from bacteria. Viruses replicate by making components and then assembling them into a final virus particle. And that's different from bacteria, which divide. One bacteria becomes two and four and eight. Binary fission, like our cells multiply. So a virus infects a cell. And if on the upper right here is what we call a growth curve of a virus-infected cell. We're looking at time after infection versus the number of virus particles made. You see, very early after infection, we don't see any infectivity. So we're taking time points in this experiment, measuring virus infectivity. In the beginning, there's nothing. We call this the eclipse period, because what happens is the genome comes out of the particle, and it's no longer infectious by the assay that we are using. Then, after a certain period of time, which varies according to the virus, you then see the production of virus particles. In this eclipse period, what's happening is the genome has not only come out of the particle, but it's, it's, it's coding for all the proteins that are needed to not only replicate the genome and make more of it, but to make proteins that will encapsidate the virus. And only when all of that comes together do you get the production of infectious viruses. Now, I bring this up because when viruses were first discovered, people thought they were bacteria. 
because people had discovered bacteria previously. And it was confusing to them that in these growth curves there were these eclipse periods, which you don't see when you put a bacterium into a broth. And that's the reason why, because they have a very unique way of making uh, new infectious particles. So let's take a break here and do another question. Which of the following is true concerning bacterial versus viral replication? Viruses must assemble using preformed components. Bacteria do not replicate via binary fission as viruses do. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. Viruses do not have an eclipse period. Viruses replicate by binary fission. Okay, everybody got virus must assemble using preformed components, most of you, 92%. And that's the right answer. They do not replicate by, bacteria do not replicate by binary fission as viruses do. That's the part that makes that wrong. Bacteria must assemble using preformed components. They don't, they just simply divide. Um, viruses do not have an eclipse. It's good, nobody got that. Viruses replicate by binary fission. Bacteria uh, replicate by binary fission. How old are viruses? Well, a brand new study came out this week showing that they're at least 450 million years old. They're early Paleozoic. This is a creature, a nautiloid cephalopod that lived 488 million years ago. You know, uh, Earth, uh, on Earth, life began as single-celled organisms, multi-celled organisms, most of it, all of it happening in the oceans, of course. And then, a little uh, older than this period, the Cambrian period, witnessed an explosion of life forms in the oceans. All of a sudden, something happened, and all different kinds of life emerged, multicellular organisms like this one, and we think at the same time, viruses evolved to infect them, and eventually, when they came onto land later on, the viruses came with them. How do we know that Viruses are 450 million years old. You can't get any samples that old, right? In the fossils, if you found fossils, the viral DNA would be gone. You couldn't do any sequencing. <clears throat> well, every animal that's ever lived probably is infected with a retrovirus, and they integrate into the genome. So today, as we are sequencing the genomes of many, many animals, everything on Earth, basically, we can see these integrated copies, we can do phylogenetic studies, and we can say how many years ago they probably went into the genome. We'll talk a little bit about that later uh, in evolution, but that's how we can estimate the age of retroviruses. Now, I think viruses were probably the first forms to replicate on Earth. I think in the early seas of the Earth, there were self-replicating molecules probably RNA. I think those were the first viruses without a host, and eventually they evolved into cells. We'll talk about that uh, later. Evidence for that, of course, is very difficult to achieve. If we move closer to today, there are historical references a long time ago about virus infections. From 700 BC, the word rabid was mentioned in the Iliad. Uh, in 1500 BC, an Egyptian carving has a, has a young priest whose leg looks like he has polio. This is a typical drop foot, symptomatic of poliovirus infection. So we think virus infections have been around a long time. Immunization has also been around a long time, way before we knew what viruses were. In the 11th century in China, they practiced what's called variolation. Smallpox was a big problem throughout human history, killed hundreds of millions of people. We've now eradicated it by vaccination, by the way. But back then, people, people would routinely die of the infection, and people noted that some people survived and never got infected again. Now, they didn't know that it was a virus or any infectious agent. They just said, well, what if we take the pustules from the skin of these people and give them to other people, and will they be protected? And so that's called variolation, and that's what's being done here. Here, they've ground up the pustules, and they're blowing them into the person's nose. Uh, later on, Lady Montague was the wife of the British ambassador to Turkey. She found out about this and brought it back to the UK. Problem is, this immunization is associated with 30% mortality because it's wild-type smallpox virus. Not a really good idea, but it was better than nothing. Later on in the 1790s, Edward Jenner in the UK noticed that milkmaids who got cowpox related to smallpox on their hands never got smallpox. So he immunized the boy with cowpox, and that was the beginning of immunization. But he didn't know viruses were involved. In fact, it wasn't another 100 years that we discovered uh, viruses. 
They were all doing this simply by observing uh, what was happening. To understand where our concept of viruses came from, we have to go first to Loyu and Hoke, who was a lens maker in Holland, and he made the first microscopes. And he saw little things in water and all sorts of other samples. You know, people of this era thought everything you saw was all the life that was. And he said, no, there are microorganisms around. Pasteur, in the eight, late, uh, middle to late 1800s, said he proved these microorganisms actually are not spontaneously generated. They replicate on their own. And they help to make milk and cheese and wine and beer and so forth. He said they can be beneficial. Finally, uh, Robert Koch, uh, also in the 1800s uh, in Germany, said bacteria can cause disease. He proved the germ theory of disease, showing that some of them cause infections. But none of them knew anything about viruses. The first virus discovered wasn't until the end of the 1800s, a virus that infects tobacco plants. Tobacco mosaic virus, already at that time, tobacco was a big agricultural product. People were smoking it, cigars and pipes. And in Europe, there was this disease going through the crops, making the leaves mottled. And this was unacceptable. So they were trying to figure out what was going on. And what they would do is grind up the leaves and see if there were bacteria growing in them. But no one could ever find a bacterium that would grow in it. But two investigators working a few years apart, Ivanovsky and Bayerink, found that a filtrate of the tobacco leaf, an infected tobacco leaf, will cause the disease when inoculated onto fresh plant leaves. So they took the leaf, ground it up in a buffer, they passed it through a filter with a vacuum that would hold back bacteria. And the filtrate they put on tobacco leaves and they found that it would infect them and cause the disease. And so this was the original definition of a virus a filterable agent, something smaller than bacteria. In fact, today we still use filters. You can buy them to, to make a virus stock. You filter it to get out any bacteria. The virus go through the filter, and you can use that for your experiments. <clears throat> so they were the first to name this a virus. They didn't know what it was, though. They thought it was some kind of a poison. And in fact, virus is Latin for slimy, liquid, or poison. They didn't really understand what they had. Uh, in 1898, the first Animal virus was discovered, a virus that causes lesions in the mouth and hooves of cattle called foot and mouth disease. They showed it was filterable. And the key concepts that were emerging, not only were these agents small, so the filter pore size was about 0.2 microns. And so that was the initial definition of virus. Today we know viruses can be much bigger. But the agent will not replicate in a broth. If you take the filtrate from a tobacco leaf, and put it in a broth, it won't grow. It needs another tobacco leaf to grow in. So this is the idea that the host is essential. After this, virus discovery proceeded at a reasonable pace. First human virus, yellow fever, 1901. Rabies, 1903. Variola, the cause of smallpox, 1906. First cancer-causing virus, 1908, along with poliovirus. Another cancer-causing virus, 1911, will de dedicate an entire lecture to the consequences of that discovery, viruses that infect bacteria, and influenza virus 1933. Okay, which is a key concept that first discovered about viruses that distinguish them from other microorganisms. Too large to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. They could replicate only in broth. They made tobacco plants sick. They were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter or none of the above. 90% of you got the right answer. They were small enough to pass through a 0.2 micron filter. That's the key concept back then that distinguished them from bacteria, which were retained on the filter. In the 1930s, the electron microscope was developed in Germany, first in Germany, then elsewhere, and we began to see what viruses were. Up until this point, many people thought they were liquid and just somehow infecting cells. But this showed they were particulate, and we saw amazing pictures. Uh, so B is tobacco mosaic virus. Turned out to be a rod-shaped virus. We'll talk more about that later. A is a bacteriophage. C is rabies virus. And D, an enterovirus like poliovirus. And today, of course, we can do wonderful things with these images, which we'll learn 
a great deal about, we can determine the structure of viruses down to the single atomic level. We know exactly how a virus is put together. This is poliovirus. We know where every atom is in three-dimensional space, and we can take these coordinates and put them on a computer and make really nice images like these. We can come up with a chemical formula for poliovirus. We know the exact composition. And there it is, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And this helps us understand a lot of the properties of viruses, as we'll see in this course. Now, there are lots of viruses out there to make their study manageable. We classify them. And I don't want you to learn the classification. But you should understand what the words mean, because you might see them, and you want to know what they are. So as you know, uh, with, there are many ways you could classify a virus. You could, the main re the way now is the nature and sequence of the nucleic acid. Nowadays, you can get a brand new virus, sequence it, and know exactly what it is. But we also look at the type of protein shell that the virus has, whether it's got a lipid membrane, and the size of the virus particle. And these are just some of the different types of morphologies that we'll be talking about. Virus classification is a system for helping you to put viruses in order. They follow the classical hierarchical system that's used to classify life forms, except we, we start at the order level. And any virus order has virales at the end. The family, which is mostly what we'll be talking about here, are viridae. So filoviridae, for example, or filovirus family, contains Ebola viruses. Below family, we have genus. Ebola virus is the genus. And then species. So Zaire, Ebola virus would be the species originally isolated from Zaire. So again, mostly we'll talk about families, genera, and species in this course. We only use them to make comparisons among different viruses. Ah, this is a filovirus, so it must have these sorts of properties. <coughs> Today, we don't simply look for viruses when people are sick. We try to discover everything that's out there and that's in us. And the technologies that have been developed in the last 10 years, PCR, deep sequencing, and many others, allow us to do this. So here's an amazing study just published last year in Nature. They took 220 different invertebrate species. And here's some of them, you know, insects, crustacean, nematodes, mollusks, etc. Collected all over China, in fact, mainly. And then they ground them up and sequenced their nucleic acid, total nucleic acid sequence, which you can do very quickly now because of the technologies that have been developed. They found two, um, in 220 different invertebrate species, 1,445 brand new viruses never seen before. And this is done all the time with different animals, soil, water, rock. People are looking everywhere for viruses, environmental samples. People go to ATM machines, and they look on the the machine and swab it and see what viruses and bacteria are there. Lots of studies to find out what is all around us. So the pace of discovery is no longer determined by disease. It's by trying to find out uh, what is out there. Now you may ask, who cares? Who cares what's out there? Let's just worry about Ebola and, Z and Zika and flu, right? Well, viruses outnumber cellular life by at least 10 to 1, a, the greatest biodiversity and genetic diversity on the planet, bar none. They drive global cycles, like I told you earlier. They probably are beneficial. And of course, at the end, they're, they're sources of new pathogens. But most, the first three points what is what really drives most of our study of viruses. Only when a new pathogen arises do we focus on it and try to prevent it. So in this course, we're going to try and balance between those two things, between discovery and understanding disease. And I want to leave you with one more thought before we break and for next time, you know, there are a lot of viruses out there. It can be complicated. It can seem overwhelming. But we can simplify it. And that's my goal in this course because of these two simple facts. First, all viruses are obligate parasites. They can only replicate after they get inside of a cell. So we can track what goes on in a cell to, rep to replicate new virus particles as a way of understanding how they work. But maybe even better, all viruses have to make messenger RNA that can be translated by the host ribosome. No virus encodes a protein synthesis system. Every one of them needs to use the host translational system, the ribosomes, the tRNAs, amino acids, et cetera, in order to make protein. So we call viruses not only obligate 
intracellular parasites, but they are parasites of the host protein synthesis machinery. So because of these two properties, it helps us to simplify all the viruses out there enormously. And that's what we'll start doing next time.